hello, good afternoon. Uh, so we're here in, uh, well, let's say second episode, if we shall, um, of cr uh, the criticism in the novel, which is uh, the lecture series organized by the Department uh, of English and German and uh, the postgraduate program in compared literature at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So today we have here, Professor Claire Petit uh, from uh, King's College London. Uh, Claire has taught at several universities such as Oxford, Leeds and Cambridge and is now professor of 19th century literature and culture at King's College London. She has written and published widely on periodical and print culture and media history uh, and has several articles on scrapbooks, annuals and miscellanies. And uh, she's the author of Dr. Livingstone, uh, uh, Dr. Livingstone, I presume, Missionaries, Journalists, Explorers, and Empire, and uh, The Telegraphic Im Imaginary, 1857 to 19, uh, sorry, 1900. And now she is uh, publishing her trilogy and today she's, uh, well, the first volume came out in 2020 and it is entitled Serial Forms, The Unfinished Project of Modernity, 1815 uh, until 1848 with the Oxford University Press. And uh, today she's going to talk about the second volume, which will come out in December 2021. And it is called Serial, Serial Revolutions, 1848 writing politics form. Claire, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, we thank are you. really glad to have you. I'm very glad to be here. Thank you so much, Julia, for a lovely introduction and thank you for inviting me to give this talk um, and just for being so welcoming. Um, you've, you've said this already, but I'll say it again. This is a talk that comes from an early chapter of my forthcoming book, which is called Serial Revolutions, 1848, Writing Politics Form in which I'm setting out to persuade Victorianists and 19th century specialists that 1848 really does matter and that we need to take the series of European revolutions in 1848 much more seriously as a matrix of social, political and cultural modernity. Serial Revolutions, as you said, um, is coming out with OUP and is coming out in December and it's the second volume in a three volume series. Um, the first volume that you mentioned, thank you, Julia, is um, Serial Forms, here it is, The Unfinished Project of Modernity, 1815 to 1848, and that came up just this, um, in, in June 2020. Um, I've just got one note here, which is that I have translated all the long non-Anglophone quotations for the purposes of this oral presentation, mostly really just to save you from my atrocious pronunciation, but also just to speed things up a little bit. Okay, so to begin. All revolutions are serial. They transmit from one location to another, either within one city or across borders and oceans, to reach altogether different places. The means and media of this transmission change according to time and opportunity. At the beginning of the 19th century, William Wordsworth wrote of, quotes, a breathing of the common wind, which would carry Haitian revolutionary Toussaint Louverture's message of freedom across the world, despite his imprisonment by the French and his death in 1803. In Haiti, conversations between slaves and sailors kept the island plugged into transatlantic politics and orally foreign news spread quickly and became part of a shared public discourse. A strong network of intercolonial contact meant that information about the Haitian Revolution fed slave uprisings all over the Caribbean. Geographer Paul C. Adams has suggested that, quote, protest is a politics of scale, describing, quote, situations in which subordinated groups reach beyond the boundaries of place through communication media to substitute their political claims, create openings for new ideas of scale and new scales of connection, and thereby challenge the social hierarchies embedded in pre-existing territorial contexts. Such scale shifting and deterritorializing through communications networks feature in the series of uprising, uprisings in Haiti and in the Caribbean in 1791, and in those in Europe in 1848. Revolutionary protesters refused to accept traditional 
territorial and actually in both these cases imperial boundaries. Instead, they bypassed or overrode dominant systems of information. Most historians of 1848 have tended to take communications for granted, but some have noticed them. Writing about Italy in these years, David Lavin considers the fact of, quotes, better communications in the period to be, quotes, banal, but important. Christopher Clark makes the point that there were no revolutionary armies spreading the word in 1848 as there had been during the Napoleonic Wars, but he notes that instead, quotes, the architecture of intercontinental communications was much more diverse and robust than it had been at the turn of the century. This paper investigates this architecture of communications and makes a case for the importance of print, and particularly the importance of serial print, as the vehicle of the transmission of the 1848 revolution. I'm going to be suggesting today that woodblock stereotyping and lithography together were ushering in an age of mechanical reproduction that was also to prove to be an age of political reproduction. Frederick Jameson has asked, what if revolution were to be understood, not so much in terms of content as in terms of form? What if the power of the revolutionary idea came fully as much from the new temporal reorganization of experience that it permits as from any practical consequences which might flow from it as effects from a cause? If we understand the 19th century revolutionary form of 1848 as serial form, it's possible to read that future directed unfurling of the serial just as the socialist anarchist Pierre Joseph Proudhon thought of revolution itself when he declared la révolution en permanence, the permanent revolution, suggesting the inescapably unfinished process of creating order. In 1848, revolutionary seriality looked unbounded and emancipatory. It suggested a future. The new forms of media stimulated by the revolutions were never entirely eliminated, even in the counter-revolutionary period, which immediately followed. They'd already created new forms of social value and new possibilities for political communication. So I'm going to think a bit now about Paris, portable Paris in 1848. Although the world's attention was focused on Paris in 1848, the revolution neither started nor finished there. A series of revolutions had ignited across Lombardy in 1847 and reached Palermo in Sicily in January 1848, but it would be the February 1848 uprising in Paris that came to be identified as the iconic revolution. After leaving France in 1847 to travel to Italy, American journalist Margaret Fuller wrote to her Auntie Mary in Massachusetts, quotes, Paris is the very focus of the intellectual activity of Europe. There I found every topic intensified, clarified, reduced to portable dimensions. There is the cream of all the milk. Paris functioned as a kind of compressor, packing all the new ideas in Europe into, quotes, portable dimensions. The Paris-February Revolution of 1848 is often discussed as the originary event that ramified outwards to other places and spawned what was understood at the time as a chain reaction. It was almost as if revolution had been, in Fuller's words, quotes, intensified, clarified, reduced to portable dimensions by passing through Paris. From city to city, eastwards across Europe, after the 24th of February in Paris, revolution ignited in Munich on the 4th of March, Vienna on the 13th of March, Budapest on the 15th of March, Venice and Krakow on the 17th of March, and Milan, Berlin and Stockholm on the 18th of March, and Copenhagen on the 21st of March. The misapprehension that Paris was the starting point is an important one. It was partly due to the established Parisian revolutionary tradition, as Eric Hobsbawm reminds us, quotes, the most formidable legacy of the 1789 French Revolution was a set of models and patterns of political upheaval which had established for the general use of rebels anywhere. So Paris had already produced the revolutionary script and had produced a fully staged version of a revolution several times already. So its own reprise in 1848 um, was also due, sorry. So its own reprise in 1848 was bound to be seen as significant. But the perceived centrality of Parisian re revolutionary experience in 1848 was also due to pre-existing international links between London and Paris and to the transnational press. London remained better connected to Paris than Paris did to the rest of France and to continental Europe. French émigré artists in London created images of the Parisian Revolution at a distance 
images which then travel back to continental Europe to be incorporated into national language publications. Speed of communications remained important to creating Paris as the centre of the revolutionary act activity and the fastest pathways of information bypassed other political particularities and other political struggles. Paris was connected to London by telegraph and by train so that, quotes, the daily bulletins from Paris retailing speeches from the Tribune, demonstrations, the beating of the rappel, rumours about the clubs, arrived by telegraph and express train and always exceeded the five-day-old paragraphs of rather generalised, disjointed narrative that came from Central and Eastern Europe. In a letter back to England from Paris, the poet Arthur Hugh Clough in 1848 painted a vivid sound picture for his friend Arthur Stanley of the cacophony of shouting newspaper boys in the streets. I'm not going to torture you by reading this out in French, but I'll put it up on the slide. All day long and deep into the evening, new editions of newspapers streamed from the presses and onto the streets of Paris, providing update after update of the latest news and keeping up a constant sense of the urgency of remaining au courant in a wildly accelerated political situation. It was not only the proliferating editions that were impossible to keep up with, it was also the number of new titles. The total press run of all the newspapers published in Paris grew from about 50,000 before the revolution to 400,000 by May 1848. A contemporary taxonomy of Parisian newsprint distinguishes between, quotes, giant newspapers, dwarf newspapers, wise newspapers, foolish newspapers, elegantly dressed newspapers, poorly dressed newspapers, large fat newspapers, consumptive newspapers. The amount of paper circulating on the streets and pinned up on the walls of Paris was unprecedented. And it was not only, Paris that, and not only Paris that saw an explosion of press as the revolutionary moment swept away censorship laws and ended the restrictions on publishing news. As well as a plethora of new periodical titles, existing titles had formerly been restricted to cultural topics such as music, art or society reporting, were now able to include political news items. For example, in Milan, the specialist music journal La Gazzetta Musicale di Milano announced that running news stories was now its sorry that running news stories was now its sacro dovere, its sacred duty, and opened its notizia section, its news section, in 1848 with the words, quotes, "Liberty, the best of God's gifts, is already starting to spread its precious blessings on the periodical press of our country." Moreover, the style of the new periodical journalism is simple, fluent and concise, and it needs to be because the words are addressed to the people and the people need to understand them. News was suddenly becoming more and more available to people across Europe. The number of political newspapers in Prussia increased by 56% between 1847 and 1850. Austria and Italy also saw a boom in newspaper publication, and even to the east, where literacy levels were considerably lower, there was an increase in Croatian, Slovak, and Slovene newspaper publication. Where there had been 13 Czech newspapers, there were, by the spring of 1848, 52. A popular political press was briefly to emerge beyond the European capitals in these years, too, in rural France, Le Feuille du, Villa, du, du Village, the village paper, in Germany, Die Dorfzitung, the village news, and in Hungary, Monaswak Upaga, sorry, I can't pronounce that, but it means workers' newspaper. Political broadsides, almanacs, calendars, flyers, and lithographs began to appear as well, offering, quotes, views of barricade fighting and political cartoons, rather than the two-headed calves or axe murderers that had previously been apolitical specialities. The intense, multifarious, and joyous press activity of 1848 demonstrates just how effectively censorship and repression had retarded public debate and popular political development across Europe which was, of course, exactly what it had been intended to do. This paper's focused on the journeys of particular examples of these views and cartoons as they travelled around Europe in periodicals during the revolution. It focuses on the visual rather than on the textual, partly because of the translatability and mobility of images across language barriers, but also, and more profoundly, because the visual was fundamental not only to the experience, but also to the conceptualization and understanding of the 1848 revolutions. Images, as Daniela Bleichmer and Vanessa Schwartz have recently argued, quotes, 
worked as key means through which audiences could create and sustain new social relations, which included new ideas regarding time and space. Yet little attention has been given to news images in 1848. I want to consider their significance not only as serial images, but as images that created the possibility of thinking serially. Because it's my argument that serial images encourage serial thinking, and serial thinking was crucial to the revolutions of 1848 to 1849. This serial thinking would then become absorbed by the liberalism that emerged after 1848. In 1848, we can trace a direct link between serial publication and serial political protest. I'm just going to think a little bit now about telegraphic connections. The public burning of Louis Philippe's throne on La Place de la Bastille on the 24th of February 1848, which is the subject of this picture or both these pictures, was understood to have set off a chain of events, which according to the Illustrated London News, quotes, spread like an electric shock and shook the whole of Europe. This lithograph on the screen representing the throne burning was produced in France and then traveled swiftly to America, where its caption was offered in both French and in English. Five days after the throne burning, the news reached Vienna, in the words of a contemporary witness, quotes, like a thunderbolt from a clear sky and caused a shock which vibrated through every nerve of her political system. A popular assembly in Mannheim was equally electrified, quotes, one idea flashes through Europe, the old system shakes and falls into pieces. In Ireland, the leader of the Young Ireland movement, William Smith O'Brien, wrote that, quotes, all Europe felt the electric sensation. Wherever oppression had been sustained by power, there the shock produced a convulsion. Lettering in America, the anti-slavery campaigner Frederick Douglass said, thanks to steam navigation and electric wires, a revolution now cannot be confined to the place or to the people where it may commence, but flashes with lightning speed from heart to heart, from land to land, till it has traversed the globe. The metaphor of electric shock and electrical connectivity for the transmission of revolutionary energy seems to have been ubiquitous. One contemporary observer in Paris wrote that throughout the whole European world, a movement burst forth simultaneously as if obeying some mandate by electric telegraph. The French people were like, quotes, blind instruments, mere agitated channels of communication, quivering wires to connect the electric element to the object destined for the shock. The ubiquity of the telegraph in the rhetoric surrounding 1848 seems to have led some historians to believe that it was indeed the new telegraph and transport systems that facilitated the copycatting of the February events in Paris across Europe. Eyewitness and member of the provisional government, Louis Garnier Page, Page attributed the rapid spread of revolution to, quotes, novel modes of communication. More than a century later, Eric Hobsbawm echoed this idea he said, quotes, an entire continent waited, ready by now to pass the news of revolution almost instantly from city to city by means of the electric telegraph. And von Strandmann, one of the most influential recent historians of the events of 1848, has continued to argue that railways and telegraphs played an important part in spreading the revolution across Europe. But in reality, there were remarkably few such links yet in operation in Europe. Indeed, Europe's most up-to-date communication system in 1848 was the rail connection from Paris to Boulogne, a steamship across the Channel, and then the Dover London Telegraph, so that Londoners were the first people outside of France to hear the news of the successful Paris insurrection on the day after it happened. But that genuinely telegraphic message did not famously inspire a copycat revolution in Britain. Other than that, a semaphore or mechanical telegraph, and I'm showing you one on the slide here, alerted Lyon and Strasbourg to the Declaration of the Republic, and a train carried news of the February Revolution to Brussels. As in 1848, Paris and Brussels were the only two continental European capitals that were directly connected by rail. There was, in other words, no joined up European rail or electrical telegraph system in place until the following decade, and what was there already was often unreliable. After some days of bloody fighting in Lyon, the semaphore telegraph system broke down while transmitting the news, and so Paris spent the 11th and 12th of April in suspense, awaiting news by other means. Indeed, much of the work of planning and installing new technologies was suspended as the political unrest spread across Europe. 
The French government had been reviewing and considering various telegraphic systems in the 1840s with a view to a national rollout, but it was only in 1850 that a cross-channel line, telegraph line, would finally be installed to England, and only by 1855 that Paris was telegraphically connected to all the prefectural French towns. Why then was the imagery and metaphor of the electric telegraph so insistent in contemporary accounts of the 1848 revolutions? I think the historians are sort of half right. The telegraph and the idea of international communication networks were indeed important to the revolutionary events of 1848, but it was far more often the idea of them rather than the fact of them that mattered. Historians of 1848 have tended to disregard or underplay the importance of another technological innovation, that of woodblock stereotyping, which was developing at the same time. The fantasy of a revolution copying itself serially across Europe with unprecedented speed was in fact far more an effect of innovative print forms than of electronic media. In many ways, 1848 was a newspaper revolution. It was the editor of the cheap and popular French daily La Presse, Emile de Girardin, who rushed unannounced into the king's chambers and told Louis Philippe to get off his throne on the 24th of February. The Republic was proclaimed on the same evening and Louis Philippe fled to England. Many members of the provisional government that was subsequently established were closely associated with the Republican press. Alphonse de Lamartine, a poet, the socialist journalist Louis Blanc, and the editors-in-chief of the dailies Le National, Armand Marast, and La Réforme, Ferdinand Flocon. So I want to think a bit now about illustrated news and its role um, in this story. The role of the revolutionary press in France in 1789 has been much examined, but less attention has been given to 1830 and to 1848, and hardly any at all to the moderate or liberal illustrated news press in 1848. The launch of the first illustrated newspaper in London in 1842, the Illustrated London News, was possible as the result of a, quote, complex conjuncture of advances in news gathering, illustration, engraving, typesetting, mass publication, and efficient distribution. In Britain, a new technique of boxwood engraving had been developed, which could be stereotyped and transferred onto metal plates. This at last delivered an illustrative technique that was capable of being used in conjunction with type and the steam engine, so that pictures could be printed simultaneously with text on the same press and at the same speed. The 1848 revolutions offered a particular opportunity for a weekly paper, an ongoing sequence of international news events that the Illustrated London News could represent pictorially and serially. The images of barricaded cities in Europe that appeared rhythmically in the issues of the Illustrated London News through the spring of 1848 depicted urban spaces, sometimes barely distinguishable from one another, but taken as a sequence, they created a powerful model of the rapidity of the movement of the revolution. The European illustrated press represented the city back to itself, engineering a new kind of attention to the physicality of the polis and its viability. The very first illustration on, um, on the front page of the newly launched Illustrated London News in May 1842, so before the revolutions, had been a picture of a huge fire which had destroyed much of the centre of the city of Hamburg. News had reached um, London by steamboat five days after the fire broke out, and an artist had hurried to the British Museum, closely inspecting a print of Hamburg, and he copied it onto a woodblock, added some smoke, some flames, and some sort of rubberneckers in the foreground, you can see here, and then it was engraved. In 1848, pictures of reported revolutionary violence in the iconic city squares and piazzas of Europe were often concocted in similar ways. The artist would work with a copy of a topographic engraving and then insert the revolutionary violence by adding flames, mayhem, spectators or barricades onto the woodblock. The illustrated press thereby participated in the development of a spectacular civic violence which was literally incised or cut into the familiar vistas of the city. This is the, an example of that is um, the Berlin Royal Palace Revolution um, in 1848, which was um, based a, a, on a topographic illustration with sort of violence added into the foreground. In 1848, the socially conservative illustrated weekly Punch, or the London Carivari, was satirizing such practices. Quotes, some interesting emerts, which are revolutionary uprisings, may soon be expected in France, 
And as the public will require them to be truly and instantaneously depicted, we beg them to state that an acquaintance of ours has on hand some old copper plates of the Bristol riots, the Porteous mob, etc., which he will be happy to part with at first cost. So the joke here is that both the Bristol riots and the Porteous mob had happened in the 18th century and were not really exactly up to date. So Punch is sort of um, poking fun at the sort of belatedness and the kind of... Um, the lag, as it were, on the Illustrated London News's um, illustrations. Mason Jackson, in his memoirs of the early years of the Illustrated London News, recalled that so great was the interest felt in the exciting events of the year 1848 that the sale of the Illustrated London News more than, was more than doubled in three months. The vigorous sketches of the French Revolution published week after week were so eagerly bought that the publisher was not always able to meet the demand. On one occasion, he was freely pelted with flour and other harmless missiles because the London trade could not get their supply soon enough to gratify their impatience. The noisy newsboys, in mocking imitation of the Paris mob, which was then making the streets of that city ring with cries of A bas guisole, vented their indi indignation with the publisher of the Illustrated London News by shouting A bas little, a bas little, so down with little, down with little. The seriality of the revolutions freed the Illustrated London News from what Charles Knight had lamented as its endless repetition of images of civic processions and banquets. The event of the, the, event of the European Revolution became a mobile plurality as it relayed and reproduced itself across boundaries. It created a different model of repetition that did not return over and again to the same scene, but rather watched an event extend and replicate itself across space and time. Crucially, the pictorial reportage of the 1848 French Revolution also depended on the close relationship that already existed between the London magazines and the Paris press. The origins of the illustrated press had been international right from the beginning. In France, Le Magasin Pittoresque had been founded in 1833 by Edouard Charton, who had, helped, had been helped by Charles Knight to establish a French version of Knight's illustrated penny magazine. Knight explained that, quotes, the art of woodcutting is imperfectly understood in France and Germany. We sell, therefore, to France and Germany many casts of our woodcuts at a tenth of what it would cost them to have them re-engraved. So Charton sent to London for the illustrations for Le Magasin Pittoresque. And these penny magazines proliferated across Europe, but they were not licensed to carry news. By the early 1840s, the appearance of the illustrated London news marked the start of a second generation of illustrated journals. The Illustrated London News paid the news tax and was therefore classified as a newspaper. Each weekly issue had 16 pages and promised up-to-date news, up news reporting in its pictures rather than the largely miscellaneous or faintly topical illustrations that had been offered by earlier illustrated journals. And it soon spawned European copies. Um, Sorry, I, I missed one, didn't I? Yeah. Um, L'Illustration Journal Universel was launched in Paris in 1843. And also in 1843, the Illustrator Zeitung was launched in Leipzig. Il Mondo Illustrato in Turin in 1847. And the Illustration Española in Madrid in 1847. Harper's Magazine appeared in 1850 in America and Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper in 1855, both in fact in New York. And Frank Leslie was in fact the British Henry Carter, quondam head of the engraving department at the Illustrated London News. The Illustrad, I can't pronounce this word well, Tidning was launched in 1855 in Sweden and the Illustrat Tidende in 1859 in Copenhagen. These internationally connected journals tether themselves to the cities of their production by representing them on their mastheads, as you can see here. Despite the insistence on their nation, national location in their mastheads, even in Italy and Germany, where no such stable sense of the national yet obtained, the formats of these illustrated magazines are in fact strikingly international identical, internationally identical. They reproduce the same headers and sections, foreign countries, railway news, theatrical novelties, the same rebus puzzles, and as we shall see, their illustrations were often literally identical too. German newspaper historian Ursula Koch has noted that, quotes, between these three papers, and she's talking about the French and German and, and British ones, so Illustration, the Illustrated London News, and the Illustrated Zeitung, 
There was an active exchange of cliches. But these fast-moving imitations and repetitions are far more significant than she suggests. The very word cliché in French derives from the printing technology of this period. In printing, cliché came to mean a stereotype, electrotype, or cast plate, or a block reproducing words or images that could be used repeatedly. So there was an active exchange of cliches between these papers, quite literally, but between them, they are also creating an increasingly familiar and shared visual lexicon for European experience. News illustration was news in itself. The unsigned editorial which opened the first edition of the Illustrated London News announced proudly that the public will have henceforth under their glance and within their grasp the very form and presence of events as they transpire in all their substantial reality and with evidence visible as well as circumstantial. The illustrations are characterised here not as only visual but tactile within their grasp, offering a form of immediate presence which is ontologically distinct from merely looking or reading. Similarly, l'illustration announced in the preface to its first edition that l'illustration will be, in a word, a faithful mirror. And it added, with a sideways glance at Horace, that, quotes, things that enter the spirit by way of the ear are less easy to hold on to than those that arrive through the eyes. Certainly, l'illustration saw its work as the reporting, saw its work as the reporting of contemporary history. This is a quote, contemporary history all current events recorded every week and accompanied by visual representations. The promise of the reportage of, quotes, events as they transpire in the Illustrated London News was only to be delivered in 1848 when the revolutions offered the first real news challenge to the paper. Previously to this, as we've seen, it had relied on its resident artist to concoct or invent many of its news engravings, working from written descriptions of recent or unfolding news events and drawing them onto woodblocks that were then sent to be carved at Ebenezer Landall's workshop on St Bride's Court. The obvious challenge for the production of illustrated news by the wood engraving method was speed. Charles Knight felt that the difficulties of getting, quotes, artists and journalists to work concurrently so that the news and the appropriate illustration should both be fresh would prove insurmountable. I knew something about hurrying on, hurrying on engravers for the penny magazine, he said, but a newspaper was an essentially different affair. Freshness was not achieved without great pain. The engraver's work was highly time pressurized and it was not unusual to have to work through the night to meet a deadline. Edmund Evans, who worked as a wood engraver for the Illustrated London News, remembered, quotes, I was often knocked up and totally unfit for work, for work a day or two after the drives of getting the blocks in on time. For the speedier production of large full page images, a team of engravers might work on a single image, each of them cutting blocks to be assembled for printing and cleaned up by a master craftsman who would adjust, ad adjust the joins between the blocks with judicious cutting. The rapidly unspooling events of 1848 themselves created new relationships with France that proved useful to the press. The celebrated French illustrator Paul Gavani, for example, set out for London in November 1847, where he knew himself to be as popular and as much admired as in Paris. Partly he was escaping debt and partly he was politically out of sympathy with the revolution. In London, he produced from sketches sent to him by his friends, including Constantin Guy's, Guy, a series of woodblocks representing scenes in the revolution of February, which were published in the Illustrated London News. It seems that sketches sent from Paris were worked up and engraved in London and then sold back to Parisian publishers, published in both London and Paris, and then often sold on to be republished even further afield. As we've seen, the reselling of blocks or casts of blocks was already an established publishing practice. This lithograph, insurgent prisoners of Paris receiving relief from their families, drawn by Gavani, appeared on the cover of the Illustrated London News on the 22nd of July, 1848. Paul Gavani's lithographs, which were clearly superior in quality to other illustrations in the paper, were usually signed and announced as by Gavani or after a drawing by Constantin, Constantin Guy. A week later, the very same image appeared in L'Illustration. In the Illustrated London News, viewers were told to see next page, where Gavani's image was insistently interpreted by a reactionary poem in praise of the merciful women in the picture, blessings on them, it says, who are bringing succor and food to, quotes, the few that erred in committing deeds too hideous for a name. 
i.e. fighting in the revolution. Appearing in France in L'Illustration, the same picture must necessarily have carried a different affect. The accompanying text insisted upon the return to normal life in Paris. Quotes, the real people, the real workmen, the landlord reassured, the trader regaining confidence. Gavani's image is not directly referenced in the text, but it seems to be presented as additional evidence of the revolution having been packed away and all the insurgents safely locked up. Viewing Gavani's lithograph at a distance in England must have been a very different experience to seeing it close up in France. And not everyone who saw L'Illustration would necessarily have felt the same way about the turn revolutionary events had recently taken. The insistent emphasis on authorship, in contrast to the anonymity of the large, multiply authored woodcut prints routinely published in the Illustrated London News before the revolution, make these images appear to occupy a new illustrative space. They seem to be offering themselves to the reader both as ephemeral news pictures and as fine art reproductions of a kind that readers might collect, keep and display. They are lithographs. Lithography was a printing technology that never entirely took off in England, but was very popular with French illustrators and artists, perhaps because it gave authority back to the artist who draws directly onto the stone block, so that the intermediary stage of transferring the drawing to the block is eliminated and a layer of mediation of the image is removed. This established relationship between Paris and London is important because it facilitated the rapid production of dozens of images of the French Revolution that were then diffused across Europe. These images could not have been produced so easily or in such numbers in Paris. First, because the technology was not available, and second, once the revolution took off, the city became chaotic and unstable. On Saturday 26th of February 1848, L'Illustration appeared with a slight delay for the first time since its launch in 1843. It hoped that, quotes, the readers of L'Illustration will forgive the delay in the delivery of this number when they understand that we did not find our printers at their posts in good time and that, like many other quarters of the town, the street that our printers is on had become a battlefield, the theatre of a civil war. Publication of L'Illustration was delayed again during the insurrections between the 22nd and the 26th of June. Ironically, then, it was non-revolutionary London that was supplying representations of the Paris Revolution back to Paris and beyond. For example, a sketch taken on the spot by a British artist of a worker atop the barricade on the Rue Saint-Martin in Paris first appeared as an engraving on the 4th of March 1848 in the Illustrated London News, and then a week later on the 11th of March in the Illustrated Zeitung. The same image was subsequently reused as a template for a lithograph issued in Frankfurt, simply titled Aina Barricada, with the French tricolor flag redrawn with horizontal rather than vertical stripes for a German readership. This form of repeated representation had consequences in practice on the streets. The deterritorializing effects of print meant that the diffusion of images of the barricade led to the diffusion of barricades to Vienna, Berlin, Munich, Milan, Naples, Budapest, Frankfurt, Prague, and Dresden. The revolutionary lexicon of barricades, red bonnets, tricolor co cockades, and the Marseillaise spread rapidly out of Paris. The illustrated newspaper's transnational intelligibility meant that even the semi-literate and illiterate could interpret and imitate the scenes depicted. Presumably, it was for this reason that one of the very first acts of many of the counter-revolutionary administrations was immediately to reinstate censorship of visual materials. As Mason Jackson put it in his history of the Illustrated London News, the pictures speak a universal language which requires no teaching to comprehend. The pictures reinforced a narrative that was already familiar. Barricades in the capitals, peasant demands for land reform, France as the instigator of an international crisis, these were all known scenarios. In Berlin, one of the barricade leaders said he could only command the attention of the unruly crowd by using magic French words like citoyen and liberté. In the library of the Russian revolutionary conspirators in St. Petersburg in 1848, a notebook was found full of scribbled entries explaining the French revolutionary vocabulary, barricades, guillotine, national assembly, national guard, and so on. And a participant in the Hungarian Revolution recalled that his leader, Sandor Petofi, had a room, quotes, filled with valuable engravings of the men of the 89 Revolution, which he had bought from Paris. We were all Frenchmen, he added, but it was the medium of print culture that made everyone, everybody, a Frenchman in 1848. 
Yet these pictures could also speak very different languages in different places, and they were received and construed by different readerships, crossing political boundaries and boundaries of opinion when they moved from city to city. In London, their informational content was probably largely read at a conscious distance and with disapproval, but in other places, they may also have been met with enthusiasm. Usually there was a week or so of delay between the first appearance of the image and its reappearance in another country. But occasionally the same pictures appeared in England, France, Germany or Italy on the same day, as for example the engraving of the death of the Archbishop of Paris, which appeared in the Illustrated London News and in Illustrated Zeitung, both on the 8th of July 1848. The simultaneity achievable by the new stereotyping technology had become available just in time to meet the extraordinary synchronicity of European news in 1848. Axel Corner notices that, quote, never before or since has Europe witnessed a situation in which at almost the same time, all over the continent, an established political regime was overthrown and temporarily replaced by a new order. In London, Punch published a topical cartoon about the revolutions, The Great Sea Serpent of 1848, on the 4th of November, riffing on the much-reported sighting of a sea serpent between the Cape of Good Hope and St Helena in early August by HMS Daedalus. So it's turned this sea serpent into, into the revolution. The Parisian Le Carivari republished this reversed image a couple of weeks later as Apparition du Serpent du Mer, and on the 30th of December, the same image appeared in Illustrated Zeitung. So this image took a month to travel from England to France to Germany. But even if the readers of the Illustrated Journals were seeing an image of an immert or insurrection a week or so after it actually happened, the revolution was still transacting. So the picture continued to have traction and relevance as part of an ongoing sequence. The Illustrated Press was intoxicated with its own modernity, and there is a striking self-consciousness in the Illustrated Papers about the role of the press itself in the revolution. It was now possible to publish newspapers of all political colours, and indeed of many actual colours. Quotes, every colour of paper was used. The Chandel Démocratique appeared in scarlet, the Sanguinaire in pink, the Sorcière Républicaine in white with yellow stripes, and the Souveraineté du Peuple in green, while the guillotine startled the public with red ink on white paper. And the previously banned practice of colportage or street crime the news was back, and the streets of European cities were suddenly filled with news vendors hawking the latest edition of the papers with the hottest news. They provide a recurrent subject, the, um, the news vendors, for illustration. On, April the 18, on, sorry, on the 1st of April 1848, the Illustrated London News published News Vendor on the Boulevards, and on the 10th of June 1848, the same illustration appeared in L'Illustration. In April 1848, L'Illustration published a series of images produced by the illustrator and erstwhile pupil of Delacroix, Andria, entitled The Great Industries of the Day, Scenes of Manners by Andria. These depicted scenes from the streets of revolutionary Paris, including the pasting officer, the latest decree of the provisional government, and the newspaper criers, the 11th edition of La Presse, afternoon edition. The joke here, I think, is about the seemingly endless effusions of the press. This is the 11th edition of the afternoon. Um, the newspapers using edition after edition in an attempt to keep up with the speed of daily events during this turbulent time. Perhaps the weekly illustrated press early adopted this method of representing the speed of news as a compensation for the necessary lag in its own reporting. Print historians Wolf and Fox have argued that, quotes, after the introduction of the Telegraph in 1844, the illustration would always be stale compared with the news. The history of news illustration is in part that of a long effort to combat the time lag inherent in the medium through as many shortcuts as possible. They argue that consequently, early news illustrations tended towards, quotes, vagueness and generalization. But as we've seen, the Telegraph was not fully functional for global news transmission until later in the 1850s. And this view seriously underestimates the impact of news illustration at a time when it was still seen as a powerful novelty. The illustrated news journals early started to exploit the particular potentialities of news images for their readerships. The illustrated London news and its continental siblings were primarily, although not exclusively, addressed to people of the middling class, 
although we know, in fact, that they re reached a wider demographic than this. All of the European illustrated journals repeatedly publish pictures of the newly formed or provisional representative bodies of 1848, because in 1848, constitutional governments were definitely news. The production of such images also was also very well suited to the time rhythms of the illustrated weekly, as opposed to the daily press. But there was another reason. The international debate was live and ongoing about the proper forms of governance and representation. The struggle between parliamentary and direct democracy was particularly dramatic in France, where the chamber of the National Assembly was invaded on the 15th of May 1848 by a crowd of radicals who wanted to establish an insurrectionary government in its place. But everywhere in Europe, the tensions between old regime power and new constitutional forms were manifest, and the new illustrated journals needed to find a way to represent new forms of political representation. Their solution was to show the people and the places in composite portraits and topographical pictures. They carry images of, for example, the French National Assembly, the German Das Reichsministerium, and other representative bodies of the newly emerging polities across Europe. The frequency with which all of the illustrated European papers publish such images makes it clear, I think, that they were considered a particularly powerful use of the new graphic potential of the illustrated news press. The Illustrated London News issued images of the members of the French provisional government as a series in groups of three portraits a week. And the comic, the comic journal Punch was quick to notice this new use of illustration, and it used it to poke fun at a fast-moving and unstable European revolutionary politics, suggesting, quotes, that in order to get through the 900 originals within any reasonable time, it will be advisable that their likenesses come out in instalments. And it offers a stereotyped picture of the French deputies, like a row of identical paper dolls. This is, of course, a joke, but it reminds us that the serial form is indeed uniquely able to organize large scale data in digestible ways. Punch goes on to boast that it has, quote, a large stock of stereotyped statesmen and skeleton heroes on file, all complete except the nose and color of the hair. And we shall have those transmitted to us by electric telegraph as soon as new leaders appear in, quotes, events so rapidly succeeding each other. After the violence of the June days in Paris, though, the counter-revolution swung into action. The revolutionary programme split with the collapse of the atelier, so that the workers and the bourgeoisie, or actually perhaps more accurately, the radicals and the liberals, no longer seemed united. It's, it's, and it's possible to discern in the pages of L'Illustration a mounting anxiety about its own position. L'Illustration, for example, did not use the image that appeared in the Illustrated London News on the 1st of July, 1848, and then appeared in Illustrated Zeitung just a week later, interior of a chamber, a family of insurgents protecting a barricade in the Rue Saint-Antoine. Instead, that same week, L'Illustration filled its edition with pictures of shelled and bombed out buildings, fires ravaging the city, and well-organized phalanxes of troops taking back the streets of Paris. The image of an apparently deserted and ruined house in the French paper suggests defeat and an end to conflict, while the family actively cooperating def to defend their barricade on the same street, which appeared in England and Germany, does not. So L'Illustration is already moving away from scenes of revolution and towards a celebration of the restoration of order on the streets of Paris. Images of families, including women and children, brandishing guns and hauling heavy furniture to defend barricades now needed to be overwritten with scenes of tranquil domesticity. One of the most curious instances of a republished image is of an engraving that was originally used as a kind of giveaway with punch in 1849, entitled There's No Place Like Home. A ruddy and smug John Bull and his family enjoy the peace and quiet of an England where no revolution has transpired, while in the border of the print, um, there are illuminations all round of violent scenes of revolutionary upheaval and martial law from around Europe. The illustration itself, in an English context, is a graphic representation of the conservative reportage of the revolutionary events of 1848, consumed from a safe distance. In February 1849, L'Illustration used the same plate, leaving the revolutionary frame in place but substituting a harmonious French family scene for John Bull's English one. 
The print, now entitled, Where Can One Be Better Off Than in the Bosom of One's Family, is both a celebration of the success of the counter-revolutionary forces in Paris and an attempt to represent a safe distance in time and place from the imagery of the revolutionary Parisian streets, which l'illustration itself had been carrying on its pages only months before. Lynn Hunt has argued that visual images of the 1789 French Revolution may help us to understand how, quotes, people came quite literally to see the world differently. And following her lead, Richard Tors has written recently of, quotes, visuality itself as a form of political praxis in revolutionary France. Hunt suggests that while lots of work has been done on the circulation of single prints in the French Revolutionary period, perhaps multiple images are important too, and we need to think about, quotes, the ways that the proliferation of prints help to make society or the social more visible and how these images fed back into imitative practice too. It is only at mid-century that technology becomes available to allow printing on a scale that meant that serialized prints reached a wide public. And as illustration and part issue emerged as an international phenomenon together, the potential for the serial publication to model movement across time and space found its corollary in the movement of the revolution across Europe. So I want to think now a bit about synchronicity, I'm, I'm nearly finished, um, and telegraphic synchronicity. Apart from offering news pictures of the conflicts on the streets, barricades, processions and revolutionary fetes, the illustrated press also put its new graphic powers to creative and sometimes surprising uses. Representing abstractions, such as the newly syncopated sense of time across Europe, or the competing constitutionalisms generated by revolutions, posed a big visual challenge. For example, Le Tracion on the 14th of October 1848 featured a full page picture of a clock with multiple faces that displayed time in countries across Europe. The same full page image then appeared in Illustrated Zeitung on the 30th of December, 1848. In its first iteration, the clock displayed Paris time on the large central dial. In the second, it displayed Leipzig time, the place of publication of the Illustrated Zeitung. The image represents the relationality of time between European cities, showing both their connectedness and the distance between them in terms of time lag. The adaptability of the central clock face to centralize any European time zone is helpfully representative of the ways in which images that were floating internationally in 1848 could be temporarily tethered and localized to one particular place at a time before moving on to another. The political situation in Europe in February and March 1848 was so extraordinary as to, quote, appear synchronized. And even at the time, this was reflected in a new self-consciousness in the press about synchronization itself, the process of synchronization. Synchronization is a recurrent theme in the illustrated journals, all of which are fascinated by the emerging communication technologies of rail and telegraph because of their potential to connect people across Europe and enmesh them in a common network. The invention of the telegraph in the 1830s had already attracted enormous press attention and had thus already begun its work of articulating space in new ways, even before the physical telegraph lines were in place. Throughout the 1840s, the papers report developments assiduously. L'Illustration, oh sorry, that's just the Leipzig um, time dial on the centre of that image. Moving on, L'Illustration illustrates the electromagnetic telegraph of Professor Morse in June 1847, and the Illustrated London News features the Electric Telegraph Company in London in January 1848. But they are also very keen to situate themselves as an important part of this globalizing media technology. The imagery of the masthead of Il Mondo Illustrato does not depict Turin, Torino, the city of its production, like London for the Illustrated London News or Paris for Illustration or Leipzig indeed for Illustrated Zeitung. Instead, the masthead represents a composite of all of Italy. You can see it better here maybe, with a steam train connecting the Colosseum to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and the Baptistry of Florence. In the Italian peninsula, which had no capital and was not a country, the journal literally fantasizes and visualizes a unified Italy by, coll by collaging a composite of some of its most famous cities connected by a yet non-existent railway network 
The illustration on the front page of the sample edition of Il Mondo Illustrato shows a heralding angel hovering over a globe encircled by a girdle. This eerily prefigures the imagery of telegraphic and electrical communications, which is to come later in the century. Here is a telegraphic angel, for example, in Harper's in 1861. And by the 1870s, Puck's promise to put a girdle around the earth in A Midsummer Night's Dream had been appropriated by telegraph companies around the world. And by the late 19th century, the idea of a girdle about the earth as a telegraphic cable connecting the whole globe had become a platitude. The barely concealed fantasy life of the short-lived Italian journal Il Mondo Illustrato is both telegraphic and universalizing as its illustrations enact its longing to insert Italy into a generalized imagination of a world republic. Le Carivari announced after all in March 1848 that quotes, France and Germany are now one and the same nation. The ideas of interchangeability and universalism which course through the pages of these journals as they share illustrations and images of revolution are in fact, I argue, telegraphic avant la lettre. Bernard Siegert has written on the materiality of the symbolic by which he means the operation of the symbolic presupposes the thing. It helps to bring the thing into being in the first place. The idea of a pan-European telegraphic network presupposed its existence and began the reorganization of space so that places were recalibrated into a new series of relays. And this newly joined up European imaginary was crucial to the emergence of a sense of the people of Europe as joined up too. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Claire. It was so interesting. I'm just going to remove your PowerPoint oh, presentation. Wow, so many things. I have a lot of questions. Um, we do have one, well, I can start actually. <laughs> so <laughs> since I'm on the screen, I'm going to start. Um, thank you so much, it's so interesting and um, I wanted, actually, I wanted to talk about two aspects um, of your talk, of your lecture. Um, first of all, I think it's interesting how some of the, um, of the ideas that you already bring in serial forms are developed and are much, let's say, I can't say progress, but um, they kind of spread around uh, Europe. And one of them, uh, well, two is this idea of multimedia and multisensorial. Yeah. Um, of these newspapers, not only, I mean, bringing people this urge to participate and um, to perhaps rebel, or, um, and even though in England, there is a counter a predominance of a, of a counter revolution <laughs> uh, discourse. There's always the images seem to, you know, um, call people to rebel, invite people to rebel. Yeah. So perhaps can you talk a little bit about um, this multimedia, multisensorial uh, aspects of these these images? Um, and this brings me to another question related to these images, which is the matter of scale, which um, you also bring up when you're analyzing Carlisle, Dick Dickens, and Pugin, isn't it? Yeah. And um, I love the, the images that you showed. So you have this, uh, the one that caught my attention was uh, the serpent one, how mm -hmm. big the serpent is in comparison yes. to the people. And the other one is that um, man with so many newspapers on his head. <laughs> yes. um, and it's, I mean, it's this idea of the, I mean, this image of the idea and the representation of the idea somehow taking over people themselves. Mm. Um, 
So yeah, I'm going to stop there. I have I have more questions, but um, perhaps you can talk a little yes. bit about these aspects. That's fabulous. Thank you so much, Julia. They're, they're brilliant questions. And you actually have read serial forms. Yes, I have. And I loved it. So and it's really, really, really great. I think you must be my one reader. It's very nice to meet you. Um, Okay, that's there's lots there's lots there. It's it's wonderful because what you've done for me really is make the connection between the first book and the second book. You did, you've done it better than I could have done, I think, um, because for those, well, for everybody who hasn't read the first book, I'm kind of interested there in, um, oh gosh, you said it better really, um, in how multimedia, I mean, including images, but also sort of performances, theatrical performances, and and other kinds of street performances are becoming in the period after the Napoleonic Wars a kind of enabler of a sort of popular political imagination and 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 also a kind of alongside that they're allowing what I call ordinary people which I know is a, a problematic phrase and we can talk about that but they're allowing people who are not particularly educated to insert themselves into a kind of historical narrative and take part in the idea of history and in the idea indeed of present history as well so that's sort of where I, where I leave the first book. And I think 1848 is, I really do think it is the kind of flowering of that in a way. It's, it's, it's what happens next is 1848, because I do think there is a massive political potential um, in that earlier period that then bursts out in 48. Um, what I, I love what you're saying. What I'm really interested in, I suppose, in this particular chapter and I'm not sure it came across very well in the paper, but I'm actually quite interested in the, in the idea of an integrated media so whereas perhaps before I was interested in, in looking at particular media or, or particular media forms separately, as it were, what's interesting about these illustrated newspapers is that they are a very modern, very new kind of integrated media. So you've got pictures and words together for the first time really on this scale. I mean, obviously not for the first time ever, but for the first time on this kind of mass produced scale. Um, and I think that's something really it's very hard for us to now imagine how, how extraordinary these images must have seemed and indeed how wonderful they must have been. I mean, how they must, they must have, in, have, have, have invoked a sense of wonder um, because people haven't seen anything like this before. So I think it's really important, and Lynn Hunt says this about the, the earlier French Revolution as well, it's really important to try and reimagine what kind of effect being exposed to these very modern, very, very new, completely kind of um, out of the blue, really, images would have on the reader's sense of their um, of their kind of social network, of their social position, of how they related to the national and the political. And I think that that question hasn't been fully asked yet. And I don't think I'm fully answering it here. Um, there's lots more work to do, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, if we restore visuality, I mean, I'm primarily a literary critic and a literary historian, so I'm not, I'm not an art historian, but I've got more and more interested in, in the visual because I think it is critical. Um, and you're absolutely right, Julia, about scale. Um, there, is a, there is an absolute kind of ideological um, scaling going on in these images. And what I loved what you said, which I think I, I hadn't quite said myself, and you're absolutely right, um, that in a sense, the images tell a very different story to, to the words on the page often. Um, and I think that's, you can see that in some of the images I showed you, that the images are perhaps suggesting something a bit more revolutionary than the very careful kind of quite um, conformist traditional text around them. Um, and just one other thing, um, I think, I love the way you said taking of people themselves. I thought it was a wonderful phrase. One other thing I'd want to say, you mentioned England and it's sort of counter, it's, it's counter revolution. I, in the book, I'm arguing that this is, this is a sort of, we've all taken this too much for granted too. I mean, what actually happens in England is that vast numbers of chartists are being hanged, executed and transported throughout the 1830s and early 1840s. I mean, really shocking numbers um, are being transported off to colonies, inverted commas, or are being actually just hanged. Um, so in a sense, I think, you know, the, the great smug boast of punch and the times and so on, that England is so stable, it never has a revolution because it's such a stable polity, blah, 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 the mother of all parliaments, all that stuff is nonsense, actually. I mean, in fact, there would certainly have been a revolution in, in England, had in Britain, had, had there not been a very effective um, counter-revolutionary revolutionary 
government espionage outfit um, that worked extremely terrifyingly, brutally, effectively to put anything down before it even could start. So I think the idea that Britain is kind of fundamentally not revolutionary is, is wrong. Um, and historians seem to just accept it too easily, I think. I did also want to say that, of course, Brazil has its own part in this story. And I do talk about it very, very briefly because the book is, is really kind of quite European focused for this particular book. The next book is, is going to be not European. It's going to be um, it's going to be a little bit more global, although that's a, world, a word I would use um, sparingly. Um, but I do talk a little bit about the um, I'm not going to pr mispronounce things embarrassingly, but the the Praera revolt in 1848 to 1852, which, of course, was Brazil's um, attempt again a bit like um, britain it was put down extremely quickly of course as i'm sure you all know but you know there was there was a lot of activity in in south america in the same period um and in fact i quote from the brazilian manifesto to the world of 1849 in the book because it sums everything up really well um about what everybody wanted across the whole world from brazil to everywhere else um it asked for universal voting rights it asked for freedom of the press it asked for guaranteed work for Brazilian citizens, and it asked for the establishment of a federalist government. Um, so those things are just everywhere. I mean, it, it really is a kind of universalist manifesto. So everybody wants political representation, everybody wants civil liberties, everybody wants self-determination, everybody wants self-governance. And actually what I talk about quite a lot in the book is how important labor and work is and the right to work, and everybody wants freedom of information. They all want to get rid of censorship laws. So that is really a, a, a genuinely kind of a global um, demand in 1848. I think I've rambled a bit, so do come back and tell me that I haven't answered. And ask no, no, that. you've actually answered that. I wonder if these images made it to Brazil or other Latin American countries. I, at I all. know they did. I know they did. They I did. Okay. Yeah, and this is one of the reasons I need to come to Brazil. Yes, <laughs> you need me? to come to <laughs> Brazil. <laughs> Because I would love, uh, that's something I would really like to, to track further. But I know, I've seen one or two, and I, and I know that they, some of them did make it. Yes, definitely. Oh, okay. That's yeah. another interesting topic. Later, it, they tend to appear with a bit more of a lag, so sort of in 1850 or so on. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, okay, I'm going to, uh, I'm reading some questions from, uh, from our, okay. our viewers. <laughs> and this is from Tiago. Uh, as you hinted, the revolutions of 1848 failed miserably. To use AJ, a. J. P. Taylor's colorful mm -hmm. phrase, it was a turning point that failed to turn. <laughs> yeah, it's about Germany. If, yeah. If, as you said, revolutions might be understood as the ushering uh, as the ushering of new forms, how did the counter-revolutionaries curtail such formal innovations? Oh, well, did that's they, yeah, did they impose older forms in lieu of the newer revolutionary forms, or did they impose alternative, albeit conservative forms to halt the spread of re revolutionary ideals? That's a really good question. It's a really good question. I, I personally don't think the 1848 revolutions failed. I mean, that's kind of what I'm saying in the book is that I don't know why we've all accepted that they failed. They didn't fail. They were put down, but that's a slightly different thing. Um, and, and, and what I'm arguing in a sense is that, that, that they did change a lot and absolutely kind of irreversibly changed a lot. But, of course, that is not to downplay the brutality of some of the counter -revolution. I mean, God, it was, it was terrible. So, some, so the brutality of the counter-revolution depended place to place. But, I mean, you know, in Russia, for example, Dostoevsky was imprisoned and sent to a work camp. And, you know, there was, it was lots of people were executed. Um, there were lots of public hangings across Europe. It was it was pretty terrible. So I'm not pretending that didn't happen. Um, but I'm not sure that means that the revolutions failed. Um, because actually, when you start to look at the... Well, most countries across Europe ended up with a constitution, which they hadn't had before. Um, you're absolutely right that the new Conservative administrations sort of tried to, if you like, appropriate and sort of recalibrate some of these revolutionary forms into slightly more um, conservative ones, they didn't really succeed. And I think the main point is that a lot of the um, revolutionaries of, um, of the 1848 revolutions ended up actually in the administrations of the counter-revolutionary states. So if you look at what happens to, to, to what we then look at as liberal government, in fact, a lot of those people are weirdly the same people. 
um, that, that were involved in 1848. Um, so, there's a kind of strange continuity which is somewhat disavowed um, in, in, the, in the history books. Um, and I think we need to think more about what actually did come of these revolutions rather than just imagine that they failed and disappeared forever. Because I think actually, and I argue in the book, they're a very, very important moment for human rights speak. Um, in fact, the phrase human rights is being used a lot in 1848. Frederick Douglass is in Ireland in 1847 and speaks about human rights there. Um, he sees the connections between um, American slavery and slavery in America and the, and the famine that's happening in Ireland. He kind of makes instant connections across, across those situations and talks about human rights. Um, it's a very important moment for feminism. And in fact, Frederick Douglass goes to the Seneca Falls Convention, the first feminist convention ever, um, when he returns from Europe in 1849. Um, so I think there's, there's, there's an awful lot that's shifting and happening um, because of 1848 throughout the 50s that does have an effect. It goes underground maybe for a bit, but actually the culture has changed and people's idea of, of, of the social has changed. And actually what fails in 1848 and afterwards are governments. I mean, the reason that these... these um, insurrections and revolutions can happen so fast is because the governments are so weak um, and, and just a, unable to defend themselves and actually failing their people so badly. Um, so I think we need to, the whole, all that talk about failure and success, I think is, is, has, been, has been kind of concealing something rather important that we do. And actually I feel now where we are now, God help us politically at the moment, is not unconnected to what was going on in 1848. And we need perhaps it's the time now to go back and, and um, if you like, kind of dig up some of those nuts that got buried. I mean, like, go back and f think about what was happening in 1848. There was a huge cry for, um, well, for equality, freedom, um, for um, both um, sort of feminist and, and racial rights and so on. I mean, you know, stuff that's still very much with us today. So I think it's a really interesting, brilliant question, actually. Um, and I'd love to know what you think as well. I feel like I'm just talking into a screen. It would be nice to hear back from people too. I included Tiago here. Maybe he'd like to say something. You're muted, Tiago. Ah. Of course, we, we thank you, Julia. Thank, thank you, Claire. Of course, we oh, thank you for for. for a, for the insights of your comments. And of course, we are still uh, sensing the resonance of the 1848 revolutions. But um, I was wondering, in some sense, uh, you've, how you've discussed the formal innovations in media, in mm -hmm. a sort of multimedia spiral, spiral that more or less transmitted the, the ideals, the slogans of the 1848 revolutions to Europe. But whether the whether governments, whether elites, or whether the culture, those who ostensibly politically and institutionally, those who rejected the promises of the revolution, what were the forms that they developed in new in print, in yeah. newspapers, in novels, yeah. in fiction, to more or less counteract? Because the, the, the later part of the nineteenth century is one of the great age of conservatism, in which conservatism becomes more or less a sort of a, a grassroots political movement. Even especially in, in, in Britain with Disraeli. Yes, and, and, yes, I suppose. That's how, also, how, how, how did they gain traction and popularity to counteract yeah, no, it's a really good question. And, the, and the cultural dissemination of, of, of the ideas of the revolution? I'm you're sorry, absolutely. I'm, no, you're brilliant. It's a brilliant point. And you're absolutely right. And it's about media forms, really, isn't it? Um, and I think actually what they do is appropriate media forms. I mean, we never return anywhere in Europe to the same, well, maybe for two or three years after, after the revolutions, but then there is, a, there is a slackening of repression and censorship across Europe and the press becomes freer. I mean, I say freer, not free, um, but there is, I think, a lot of, I mean, this is something that the history books do say, there are concessions, um, lots of concessions are made, constitutions are allowed and newspapers start to 
um, carry more news and the news taxes go down or are abolished and so on. So I think, yes, you're right about conservative in England, but also liberalism is really important. And I think what really comes out of, and Gladstone's as important as Disraeli, I think, yeah, and what really comes out of these revolutions is liberalism, um, which isn't what the revolutionaries wanted. It's an unintended outcome, if you like. But I think there is a sense in which a the, I think the 1848 revolutions asked the question very clearly, what is it to be human? And it became increasingly difficult after that for really despotic regimes to deny humanity in the same kinds of ways that they had before this moment. So there is a, a sense in which they need and have to inhabit some of these forms, appropriate some of these forms. Um, and, the, and of course they do. I mean, the, you know, the, the, press, the press thrives actually after 1848. It, it, there are big gains, I think, from the revolutions. So there is a rebalancing, obviously, and you're absolutely right that the conservative forces, I'm not sure, I mean, the end of the 19th century in Britain is, yes, okay, conservative, but also, you know, it's the fin de siècle, and, and, and I mean, there's Oscar Wilde cavorting around and stuff, so uh, it, it's, it's a contested period, actually. Um, but I do take your point, and it's a brilliant one, and actually, it's kind of what I want to do next, and I haven't yet done, is, is think about, you know, what does happen um, if we think about where communications go after this? Because I, I need to do that work, and I haven't yet done it. That's, that's kind of for the next book. Um, but I'm really, it's really helpful for you, thank you, actually, to, to, that you've clarified that um, as one of the aims of that book, because it is a really obvious question. And I don't know about you, but when you're stuck in these things and the detail of your research, sometimes the obvious questions just sort of, duck down behind the horizon a bit. So and that's that's a really good question, thank you. I am the one to thank, uh, who thanks you, thank you. I'll, so I'll just leave uh, and, and leave Julia and, and, and you by yourself. You're welcome to stay. <laughs> no, I'm shy. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to get, um, I'm going to read out some other questions. So we have a question from our colleague and friend, Luciana Villas-Boas. She's also, um, she's a, an early modern um, <laughs> researcher. So um, I'm going to read it out for you. Uh, in your work, you move away from a view of the revolution as a sudden break of established order to embrace a view of revolution as the serial spread of recycled images. But I would like to understand, uh, to understand more uh, your big conceptual and historical ass assumptions. This is a serialized question. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, sorry, this got, um, are you saying that print culture can be treated as an autonomous historical factor without relating them to specific political and social agents? And then there's a fo follow-up question, uh, is what you call the serial reproductive itself a sort of representation of the revolution? that stands in co contradiction to the revolution as actual change. Can you tell me more about your concept of revolution? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Um, yes, uh, I, see, I see the critique there and I think it's a good one because I think we do not have much evidence. Um, we have some, but not much evidence of who was reading these particular illustrated papers. We know quite a lot about the British case, we know, and, and the German, but less about the others. So there is that. I would never say, and, and yes, I work on print culture a lot. I would never consider that print culture can ever be um, removed from its social or political context, really. I, I, I feel it's that's something that would be quite impossible to do. So I always think of it as, as both reflecting and creating new social matrices, I suppose. And that's what I was interested in here. As far as my views of revolution are concerned, I suppose what I've just been saying really um, might help with this, which is that there is a huge um, importance given by historians to the moment of revolution um, and whether it succeeds or fails. Um, although it's not always quite clear what success would look like. Um, it seems always quite clear what failure looks like. And I suppose I agree with Hannah Arendt, actually, who talks about this in her book on revolution. She talks about how there isn't really enough time or thought given to the periods between revolutions. 
So, you know, what's fermenting, what's happening between revolutions? And I suppose that's where my kind of idea of seriality becomes important because I think, you know, rather than thinking about revolutions as standalone events that either succeed or fail, it might be helpful to think about revolutions, the actual revolutionary violence as one moment in a continuum of revolution, which is a very kind of Marxist position in a way. But not to, I mean, Marx doesn't give, a ten, in fact, in the 18th Brumaire, of course, he writes off 1848 as a farce. So he doesn't think much about the periods when the revolutionaries have to regroup and rethink how they're going to take take this forward. So I'm quite, inter I'm interested in, if that makes any sense, I'm interested in sort of pulling out and attenuating the idea of revolution. So it's not quite so much about violent outbursts and it's more about the ways in which ideas are being transferred, in this case, across Europe um, and the ways in which they're unevenly, but strangely, identically in some ways, changing views about polity, about politics, about about citizenship, actually fundamental, about what, what it is to be a citizen. Um, so I'm not sure I have a, a, I don't have a great big theory of revolution, partly because I think that's been part of the problem. I don't want to have a great big theory of revolution because I think actually if we need, if we need to look more closely um, at what actually happened and what actually happened in 1848 really was quite remarkable, I think. Um, and therefore, it's important to think about what did 1848 create in terms of a kind of, if you like, revolutionary output, if you like, um, and how and where did that go next? What happened next? And I think there is a continuity as much. So I don't, I don't see it as, a, as I don't see revolutions as as as, as great breaks in time. I see them as. Um, as part of a, of a, if you like, a, a serial. I mean, my idea of seriality actually is not, perhaps, it's not quite as I'm making it sound. The idea of seriality in this book is really a Sartrean idea of seriality, where Sartre talks about social seriality. So the idea of, um, of, of people being able to coalesce, however different they are how, and wherever they are, around a shared idea or concept or struggle. So, there's a sense, I think, of serialty not as a kind of linear sequence, but more as a kind of um, serialty as a means of people identifying the same problems at the same time. Um, so, for instance, realizing that their despotic government is letting them down, and therefore realizing that they have a sort of social seriality with other groups of people who are realizing the same thing in different places. So it's, it, I mean, Sartre is really brilliant about this, I think, um, in his, his, his um, dialectical critique. So I think there's a, a sense in which the serial, for me, is not one thing happening after another. It's more the idea of ideas which are moving, transmitting. I wouldn't say circulating. Because um, that, that's, not, that's not a helpful image for me. And I don't think it, it means quite what I mean by um, ideas moving serially, um, because I think an idea moving serially is always um, somewhat changing on its way from one relay to another. So I don't know, I'm not actually, I was about to say I'm not that interested in revolution, which is a silly thing to say, but I suppose I'm more interested in what is achieved by by this moment, and also I'm very interested in why. And this this maybe doesn't really work um, if you're if you're not British, because I think in certainly in British history it's completely ignored. We never we certainly don't teach it. Um, and I teach 19th century English history. We don't teach it. I think it's actually having written this book. I think it's hugely important for the um, for the for the instigation of realism, literary realism, actually. I think there's all sorts of things to say about 1848, but we don't teach it. It's not a significant date in the British historical calendar at all. It's kind of considered something foreign, something that happened somewhere else, something nothing to do with us in that rather, you know, British exceptionalist way that we tend to have, unfortunately. Um, I know it's taught differently in other countries because my husband's Italian and I know he was taught 1848, of course, completely differently where he grew up in Rome. Um, 
But I'm interested in that disconnect and why it is that somehow in the Anglophone hist historiography, it's dropped out of view and it's not considered terribly important, when I actually think it, it is quite important. Um, and I think it's important partly because, as I was saying just now in the paper, it's the moment when the press, when print finally kind of catches up um, with a, a certain kind of popular politics um, in a big, big way and in a transnational way. So I'm not sure I'm answering, and I would love to hear what you have to say as well, if that's Yeah, possible. I mean, it's a shame that you can't see Lucia, and I can picture I can't see you, 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 you talking so right weird. now. She, well, she did comment here. She said, I do understand the need in Britain to charge revolution with a positive semantics. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love this comment. It's great. Um, and she has one more question for you. Oh, it's a shame that we can't do this, you know, with more people online, yeah. you know. Um, and she says, uh, thank you. One more thought. The serial implies a concept of time and change different from the revolutionary concept of change. Yeah. Do you recognize this tension? Could you talk about it? Yes, because the revolution, I mean, yes. I mean, the sort of Marxist idea of revolution is very much one of complete break, right? Um, and of course, the French Revolutionary, you know, return to year one and all of that stuff. Um, and I don't think that you're absolutely right. There is a very, I think, quite productive tension, but there is a tension between the idea of starting anew and the idea of, of the serial, of things just kind of moving on. Um, and I'm not, as I just said, I'm not that interested in a kind of serial linear idea. And, and I'm not. I'm, I'm resisting what happens to the idea of serialisation later in the century, which is um, that it gets very tied up, of course, with the idea of progress and a kind of and a, and a kind of um, liberal Whiggish kind of idea of of, of progress. Um, but I do what I, I return to what I've said. Really, I do think seriality for me is important, and what I mean by it in a way is the self recognition of peoples in different places and speaking different languages. Claire? Oh my God, I think it was Kella. Thiago? Você está me vendo? Eu não estou te escutando, você está mutado. É, a Claire congelou. É, eu acho que ela caiu. Eu acho que ela, a internet dela caiu. Ai, que pena, porque eu estava gostando da resposta dela. Vamos esperar um pouquinho ver se ela volta? Sim. Eu acho que a, que a internet dela deve ter caído. Pessoal, enquanto a Claire não volta, é só para falar para vocês que o, a gente emite certificado, mas para a emissão de certificado vocês têm que preencher o formulário de presença e que o Tiago vai, vai colocar aqui e também mandar um e-mail para a gente para pedir o certificado, tá bom? É... Ai, tomara que ela consiga voltar, tomara que a internet dela não tenha caído de vez. Você tem o celular dela? Júlia, não, talvez. mas eu estou checando o meu e-mail, a gente estava se falando... Por e-mail. Mas eu acho que ela é... Bom, a não ser que a internet dela tenha ido de vez. Ah, a palestra foi excelente. Eu queria tanto que ela voltasse porque eu tinha mais perguntas. Muito bem. <risos> Vamos esperar um pouquinho... Vou ver se ela me manda algum e-mail aqui. Devia ter passado meu celular para ela, para ficar facilitar. Oh, ela voltou. Am I back? You're back. I, something happened. Sorry about that. The internet just went... No, it's okay. No, it's okay. I'm sorry, I'm not in my office. I'm not even in my own country. So it's, it's a little bit hand to mouth here, but we're, we're doing okay. 
No, we're doing fine. It's been great. Um, so you were talking about uh, the concept of, uh, no, you were talking about the concept of revolution and the tension. That's what yeah, we were so talking about. Yeah. The tension between the serial and the concept of revolution. Yeah. And the, and the complete break. I don't know where I got where I got to where I collapsed. So, um, but I think it's a great question. I think there is a total tension. Although I would return to my idea of the serial not as linear, not as progressive, but as the self identification of different peoples in different places of a common cause. So that that's my idea of seriality, which I have definitely pinched from Sartre. Um, so the idea is that it's more that there that the revolutionary outcome of 1848 is more that self-identification of different peoples across different places, which I think does continue and does endure. And could you could argue represents a success for the 1848 revolutions. Um, so yeah, I completely I completely get the idea that the um the you know the usual kind of idea of revolution is you know it's often there's the volcano, there's the earthquake, there's all those analogues. Um, it's supposed to be sort of almost sort of a geological shift in time. And that's not the way I'm thinking about 1848. And I, and I also am deliberately not thinking about 1848 like that because I think I'll, that's part of the problem that perhaps I'm trying to address, which is it has been thought about like that. And if you try and put it into that mesh, it doesn't work and it fails. But if you take that mesh away, then maybe you can see different kinds of things happening that do endure and are important and do feed directly into liberalism and I would yeah. say into realism afterwards. Yeah, and I also, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I also understood your idea of seriality as a sort of juxtaposition and, um, and also always constructed under tension between yeah. the individual and the social, um, the unity individual and political, yeah. I think you even say this, political unity and political division. I mean, the great, and, sorry, go on. Yeah, no, and, and I thought about this in your talk because all of these, um, these, these images being spread around Europe and um, creating, at, at the same time, a sense of of uh, national divisions, right, in which people yeah. are kind of create cre constructing their own national identities, uh, whatever that means. Yes. There is this also this idea of wholeness, this idea of yeah. a continent, a continental yes. uh, connectivity, in which this kind of revolution and this spirit of revolution. I don't know if. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong with this idea. You're yeah. right. That's wonderful. You're a wonderful reader. Um, yes, that's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that serialty can do is hold dis disparate elements together in with those tensions unresolved. I mean, that's something I think the serials do. If you think about, God, now he's put too many lights on. Now that one off, please. I've got <laughs> I've got someone doing my lighting here, but I'm. Yeah, I think that's better without that one. Otherwise, I think I'd become like a sort of blaze of glory. Yeah, like um, an angel. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, no, you're absolutely right. So I think that the, the serial form offers a kind of holding pattern for, which can include tension, will include, will include tension, not just can. You're absolutely right. And also I'm really, I'm, thank you for bringing up the nationalism theme because of course that's something else I talk about in the book. That this is a moment which I think for us now is actually quite hard given what we're all going through at the moment. It's hard to understand sometimes just how emancipatory the idea of nation was at this point. Um, and also, as you just said, Julia, beautifully, n that the idea of nation did not preclude the idea of the universal and, and was a very kind of federalist idea of nation, actually. Um, so not what we have now with our popular nationalisms at all, something quite different, um, which was about, of course, um, getting rid of the of the yoke of, of imperial um, rule, in fact, for most people. Um, or maybe, I mean, it's it's different. We're looking at very different polities across Europe. So, you know, in, in Germany, it's more, um, you know, that the, the, the working peasants are, are, are fed up with a kind of feudal system. So, but it's, but what's, not, what the nation seems to offer is, is a way of, of identifying with others who are in the same boat as you. Which it isn't quite, isn't quite how it is now, I don't think. I mean, I think nationalism has shifted its no, yes. It's values. Um, yeah. We have one question here from Sankley Mendes. Uh, 
Shall you, Miss Petit, comment the ethnic intellectuality displayed by the actors of revolution that obviously bloom in our time and will continue feeding our beings and our structure? Thank you. I missed the adjective. Can you just read the first line again? Uh, comment on the ethnic intellectuality displayed by the actors of revolution that the, obviously bloom in our time and will continue feeding our beings and our structure. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think that, I think I understand that um, to mean that actually that this is also a moment when um, lots of disenfranchised people and lots of um, different ethnicities and different racial groups are finally allowed some kind of voice. So there is this kind of, I was finishing this book during um, the Black Lives Matter protests that were kind of actually kind of serially moving across America, literally as I was finishing the book. Um, and, I, and I did think, you know, this in a sense, again, um, Frederick Douglass is, is talking about the humanity of, of black people in America in 1848. And we're still dealing with, well, failing to deal actually um, with these questions today. So I, again, I do think 48 is one of the first places where those voices start to be heard on a global scale in a big, big way. Um, I don't know if that's answering the question, so I wasn't sure I quite understood the question. So that might be wrong. My fault. Um, yeah, no, and I think um, perhaps, you, I don't know, I know it's the third book in the trilogy, which enters mm -hmm. the digital age, but um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about this, because I, I, I think it, you've already mentioned this, but how um, this notion of seriality, of course, has a whole different meaning for us today. Yeah. Uh, I mean, thinking of the new means of, I mean, social media and so yeah. on and yeah. how these news circulate. Um, but even the idea of fake news, I remember, I think yeah. one of the examples that you give in serial forms includes fake yes. news. I don't really remember which news it was, but I remember that. It was in 1848 and people make fun of it all the time and people yeah. are constantly, um, there's all sorts of rumors flying around that, you know, um, Queen Victoria has, has abdicated and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's absolutely part of the story. Um, but no, I really, that's a really great question because the next book is really going to be about a different, I mean, I, I suppose taking seriality into the idea of the digital means thinking about binary, thinking about code, thinking about the sort of transmission of, of coded signals and so on. But it also is about something that a lot of people have been writing interestingly about recently, which is about the kind of, um, racialization of media from from of electronic media right from the very beginning, um, and I'm qu I'm quite interested in that. I think it's no coincidence that Morse, who is the you know an inventor an inventor of the telegraph, because there are lots of people inventing different telegraphs at the same time, but he's an inventor of, of an important telegraph system, and of course, of famously of the Morse code, is also a nativist and an absolute racist. And you know, there's there's a kind of story there I think which is beginning to be told about exclusion as well as inclusion. And I think, you know, the story after, I tell a fairly fairly bright story about 1848. It gets much darker, I think, after after 1850. Um, so yeah, that's, that's gonna be my task to come. Um, but yeah, I think the whole, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's still an interesting question, isn't it? How much social media, I mean, certainly in the Arab Spring, there was a question about how much Facebook played a role in that in that uprising. Um, I think, you know, there's still a question about what does what does media do that is social? We call it social media now, but what does it do to our sociality? What does it do to our sense of, of ourselves as social beings? And that's something we agonize quite a lot about now, and we probably should, because I'm not sure it's doing always the things that might help us the most. It's interesting because this feeling of participation and of citizenship yeah. that you claim both in the beginning of the 19th century as after 1848, this feeling of citizenship, partic political participation mm -hmm. created by the, uh, with, by the media. Um, this is, I think, the opposite of what we have today because yeah. it's not really a feeling, there is a feeling of participation, but it's an isolated uh, uh, participation because it's more about, let's say, a narrative of the self Yes. Uh, then yeah. rather, um, yes. then rather a political participant, political yeah. discussion. 
I think that's right. I mean, I think one of the things I feel we've lost is, is just, I mean, it, it feels almost naive to say this, but, but this, the thing that you read over and over again when you're reading around 1848 is about this great universalist idea of humanity and how important it is to be human. Um, and I, I know I sound ridiculously romantic, but I think we're sort of losing ourselves in smaller and smaller series now. I mean, I think, you know, um, we are identifying in particular ways, which is fine, but I think we do need to hang on to an idea of common humanity. It's quite important, actually, and, and too much, too much, I don't know, too much, the identity politics are an interesting challenge to universalism. I'll just go that far. I don't want to sound like some awful reactionary old bag. Um, but, you know, I do think that being I human is quite important. You. Yeah, and it's, we have to include everybody in the human, like nobody should be left out. Um, and that's sort of what 1848 is saying. That's what they're saying in 1848. Nobody, even even the you know the most indigent, the unemployed, the women, the children, nobody should be left out. And that's still a pretty revolutionary idea, actually. Um, Tiago made a comment here. In the early 2010s, there was a certain techno optimism which stated yeah. that Facebook would bring down autocrats. Yeah. Eventually, authoritarians captured these new forms of media. Yes. Which is kind of re reflecting back on his, his own great question, yeah, which is the way things get appropriated immediately um, by big tech and governments and all kinds of other sinister agencies. Um, we mustn't be too pessimistic, though. I mean, we I still feel there is the potential to be using these media forms very effectively, if we could work out how. I, I think there's potential. Do you not... I don't know. Uh, we've been kind of pessimistic here in Brazil. Brazil's been pretty <laughs> horrible recently. Yeah, it's very horrible at the moment. And it oh, is, yeah. um, there is a sort of seriality here of politics. Um, yeah. It mostly feels like a, 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 a soap opera, an endless soap opera, uh, a yeah. bad taste in very bad taste. Yes. And, and, um, yeah, I think the problem is uh, my when I think about social media and the relation between the relationship between political participation and social media and these new means of communications is that um, there is I mean it's it's as if we as a society we have less let's say we have less of feeling we have we have we don't really have a feeling of let's say, sharing a collective yeah. social a collective right? into a social yeah. and yeah. there is um and, and it's not enough to share this in social media. Yeah, especially exactly. because social media is actually always, let's say, affirming your beliefs and not really expanding yeah. your world. Yes. So if we lose um if we lose an understanding of a collective, of a social, of you know, yeah. connectivity then how are we supposed to find um, the political? Of course, but that's exactly um, that's exactly what capitalism wants us to do, isn't it? I mean, in a sense, we're much easier as target markets if we if we lose a sense of the collective. And I start identifying ourselves by you know particularly liking pale blue and cats and so on. You know, if it, it, that makes us much easier to sell to. Yeah, I mean, really, there is a logic there. Yeah, uh, or even an identity. I mean, I think uh, um, yeah. social media is um, has taken has taken a lot from the politics of identity yeah, and left absolutely. only an identity. I agree, <laughs> I agree entirely. Yeah, 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 which is very, very cynical and and sort of empties yeah. everything in a very frightening way. I agree entirely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I'm so excited to read the following books. Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm. Oh dear. <laughs> I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna have to make this an annual talk until you finish your trilogy. <laughs> I could be here until I'm 96. Um, no, I need to finish it. I need to finish it. Um, no, and then and then next time you'll uh, you'll come to Rio. I would love to. I would yes. really, really, really love to. And we'll take you to the Fandelic Island. That's our campus. <laughs> <laughs> Fandelic <laughs> Island, yeah, Ilha Fundelica. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, oh, that's yeah. We can actually see each other and 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 be together again. I mean, quite apart yes. from a collective, we've lost all sense of being in a room with people. Recently. Yes, yes, so. yes.
it's been yeah. really odd and really terrible. And I know it's been really bad in Brazil because I've, I've yeah. said to Jim, I have, I have um, Brazilian relatives. So, yeah, I've been hearing from them just how miserable it's been. Yes. So I'm sorry. It's been a terrible time. Yeah, so are we. But yeah. it, pass. it shall pass, I think. All things must pass, I suppose. <laughs> yes, Eventually. yes. Thank yeah. you so much, Claire. Well, it was thank you for having me. I'm sorry if it was all a bit sort of. Um, I, I'm not sure I was at my best because I'm in the no, street. No, but it was great. Not in my own place and so on. But it was lovely to talk to you all. Thank you. And it was lovely. It was great. Um, thank you for accepting our invitation. We hope to host you uh, face to face next time. I would and love to do that with Mark Turner and do a double header. Yes. Yeah. Yes, with Mark Turner. We have a compression project together at the moment, so we could talk about that. I'm, oh, I'm, yes. I'm volunteering Mark without his knowledge, but I'm sure he'll be fine with it. No, he'll be fine. He'll be fine. He Every time we talked about Brazil, he seemed to, I think he has friends here. Yeah, he does. Well, he yeah. has friends everywhere, of course. But yes, yes, he does. Yes. He does. Yeah. He does. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was Thank really you. amazing. Thank um, you. Enjoy your, and thank you for talking to us in the middle of your holidays. Okay. Um, we feel very special. <laughs> we are very special. It's <laughs> lovely to meet your acquaintance and I hope we will continue our contact. Yes, me too. Me too. Thank you. And thank you everybody for, uh, for watching um, and for participating. Um, and we'll see you again next month. Our next lecture is on the 29th of September with Professor Daniele Corpus uh, from uh, the Compared Literature Department from Okay, so thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Julia. Thank you.